Hi there, everyone. This is Debbie Delbridge or Deborah Delbridge, and my dog is saying hi. <laughs> Um, right now, I am going to uh, talk a little bit about faith. I am the author of Why We Self-Sabotage, and right now, I'm going to be, what? <laughs> I'm talking about chapter three, and chapter three goes into faith. And why is faith important? Because when we have faith, faith can override our self-sabotaging tendency. So we may have tendencies. <laughs> he wants to sit in my lap. We may have tendencies to self-sabotage, but when we have faith for a specific thing, our self-sabotaging tendencies won't sink in and won't have dominion because, <laughs> hello, sir, sir, because uh, faith overrides it. Okay, seriously, can I, what, what? Okay, are you done? Are you done? Okay, I guess he wants to be with me when I talk about faith on account of he's, he is, uh, he's a cling bot. He's very clingy, very lovey dovey. Okay. Uh, I do, I don't want to take a lot of time with this because, uh, I, I want to, um, just be concise so we can, we can move on. But truly, uh, faith is not what we believe in our head. It's what we believe in our heart. Faith is not what we believe in our conscious mind, but it's what we believe in our subconscious mind. That is authentic faith. I didn't know that when I first I was raised in an evangelical church, and we weren't taught about faith. We were taught about faith for salvation, but that's really it. We weren't taught about um, faith for receiving healing because, you know, they didn't embrace that or, or finances or anything else. And then I backslid between the ages of 19 to 29, and then when I gave my life back to God— in a radical way, I suddenly found myself in Bible school and I was learning for the very first time what faith is, that uh, you can believe something, you can believe God's word and that can become your reality. That was brand new information to me. And then between 1995 and 2000, when God was really teaching me about diseases of the soul and I was also, I, I learned some things about uh, from psychology about our subconscious mind, uh, I, I got a new awareness of it that really faith is something that is in our heart, not something that is in our, our mind. You know, Mark 11, uh, 23 says, For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, where his subconscious mind, but believes those things that he says will come to pass, he will have whatever he says. So this is God, this is Jesus speaking to us, basically telling us that we as humans, as believers, we have the potential to be miracle factories. If we can get information from our head to our heart, we can literally move a mountain. I know that a lot of believers, they like this verse because it gives them hope, but a lot of times they don't really believe it. They don't believe it because maybe at one time in their life they had a problem and they spoke it out for that problem to go and the problem didn't go away. And so they don't really think that the verse is true. Well, the verse is true. What was false was your understanding of it because it's not what we believe in our head and, and have mental agreement about is what we believe in our heart, our subconscious mind, that that truly can move mountains. And uh, in a literal sense, it's not figurative, it's not anything else. This is when we have an authentic faith, miracles can be done through us. So the idea is to have a better understanding of this so that we can operate and do the things that God wants us to do and, and operate in that kind of power and authority because that's what God has for this generation. God wants us as his people to do execute his plans on the earth. And a lot of times that's going to mean speaking to that mountain to go in Jesus name. So we need to, you know, I mentioned it in the last section, in the last video, that our, our psyche is like a computer and our, our subconscious mind is like the hard drive. But we don't know everything that's on the hard drive, but we do know the hard drive can be reprogrammed through, you know, programmer would, would type in programming, reprogramming phrases and symbols and signs. Well, what happens is when we hear words, our conscious mind is the, um, is the gateway. And by words, we can change what's in our subconscious mind. True faith has the ability to change our current reality. 
uh, but it must be present in our subconscious mind. And is it any wonder that the devil really just works overtime to keep people ignorant and keep people emotionally wounded? When our subconscious mind is wounded, weak, and diseased, we will oftentimes reject authentic faith so miracles won't develop in our mind. You know, we look at the parable of the soils. Okay, I don't want to go into a tangent because I have material that I'm trying to cover. But when we look at the, the parable of the soils, we see that, uh, you know, the, the cares of this world choke out the word and all that kind of thing. So if we understand how faith really works, we would get a fresh revelation of that if we were to look at the parable of the soils. Okay, I'm going to move on. I don't want to uh, take time to teach on that right now. But faith is a, belief, uh, is a belief that we have in our subconscious mind for a specific thing. If we have faith in our negative circumstances and our negative self-talk, guess what? We will manifest that reality in us. If we have faith in God's word, not in our head, but in our heart, that's what's going to be manifested in our life. So Faith is a precursor for our reality. So what you have in your heart will be your, re you know, there's that verse that says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Well, if you think you're rich, you will be rich. It's because it's what you believe in your subconscious mind about your identity will, will uh, manifest what happens in your life, will manifest your, your, your future. So uh, faith is important. Faith has power. And it literally has power to move a mountain, but is, you know, positive faith can move a mountain out of the way. Negative faith can put a mountain in your way. So what we believe in our subconscious mind is extremely important uh, to, and we need to not take it lightly, but really delve into understanding it more and really understanding what we have within us. Also, faith and fear are opposites. One of the ways to understand move dog. <laughs> One of the ways to um, try to understand if you're in faith or not is recognize, is there fear present? If there's fear present, then the faith may be a little bit weak. You know, in the summer of 1996, you know, I got radically rededicated my life back to God in 94. And then I found myself in a Bible school. Anyway, I hadn't had income for a, a two year period. And in 96, I was sitting in a West Coast Believers Convention. They had the, they used to have those here in Southern California every summer. And I, I don't know how God sustained me two years with no income, but he did. But I'm, I'm there in the message, I'm there in the service, and Jerry Savelle was preaching about um, when you're at your end of the rope, when you're at your end of the rope, let go and trust God. Okay. You know, great message, great title, whatever. But something happened in that service where it was almost like a light switch went off where I got it. That message caused what I knew in my head to sink down into my heart. And then all of a sudden it was like just peace. I had peace. So instead of the two year, wor you know, worrying, where, where am I going to get the money for rent? Da -da 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 -da. Am I missing God? Should I be doing this? Should I be doing this? Should I be doing this? There was a peace that came over me and a fear of financial lack just left me. And in that case, I, I, almost, I found the light switch of faith where, where a, a truth that God had went from my head to my heart. And that's really what we need to achieve is to find that for in our lives and, and, um, it find that light switch of faith because it's really we're living in a different reality. We're not living according to the world system, but we're now living according to to God's system, and and we are having faith in what God says to us. Faith is a fearless peace that rests on us. So and and, and it almost felt like a blanket was taken off of me. That's how it kind of felt when uh, when I had that revelation. And it was still a couple months, two or three months uh, before I even received any money after that. I don't know how I survived because in that, in that uh, services, that day I think was the day that I had given my very last dollar bill into the offering because I had one dollar. <laughs> how sad is that? I gave my very last dollar into the offering and I didn't know how I was going to have the six dollars to pay parking for the next day. Yeah, I went the next day. 
I don't remember how it happened. I don't remember where the money came from, but God kept sustaining me. It was like that widow woman where, where the oil never runs out. Okay, all right. So God just kept sustaining me, but it was a season that I had to go through. Now, I don't think everybody's supposed to go through a season of financial lack. God wants us blessed. And, and too many times when there's lack, financial lack in our life, it's not at the instruction of God. Oftentimes it's things that we are doing that we self-sabotage. You know, Oral Roberts had that saying, miracles are either coming to you or passing you by every day. And a lot of times what we can do is we can self-sabotage and cause the blessings that God's trying to bring into our life to pass us by because of our self-sabotaging tendencies. So that's why this is a good book to read to try to identify some of those self-sabotaging tendencies. But for me, I believe God had me go through a season of lack because he needed me to get to the place where I would learn how to trust God for finances. Because the next season that I went into, I, I was going into a season where I was gonna be leasing an office of 9,000 square feet and I had all these people um, working. And, and I, I had to have the peace of mind to take on all the responsibility and overhead when in real estate and in loans, you know, it's commission-based. We don't know if the fountain's gonna dry up. There is no surety that we're gonna have the money to meet the next month's bills. So it was a walk of faith. It was a, a step of faith when you, you know, sign a, a lease for, for a large space, especially in Irvine, where it's hugely expensive. But that season, I think, was good for me. I, I've walked through many seasons of tremendous financial abundance, and then I've walked through seasons of financial lack, but it doesn't phase me. I don't, um, my personality doesn't change. I, my self-esteem doesn't change. I, but what it did do is it taught me not to be as concerned with, with monetary things. It's not that important. Houses are not that important. Cars are not that important. So it, it was good for me to walk through that season because it, it, it helped me. Because you could learn a lesson in theory and all that other stuff. But when you walk through an experience, you, you, you are able to glean a much greater understanding just to have that experiential knowledge, not just head knowledge. So, um, so now I want to talk about faith for healing. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this story. I do talk about it in the book, so I do encourage you to read this chapter. But I'm trying to keep this video brief, so I'm not going to go into full detail. But in 1998, I had a raging, painful abscess root canal and it was infected it was swollen there was pus it was ugly i had gone to the dentist now i was selling real estate at that time and real estate we go from commission to commission there's no salary so i went to the dentist and he told me it was going to be fourteen hundred dollars and i didn't have it you know i i had paid my rent and the next real estate transaction was going to cover my next rent but i didn't have the extra money for this procedure and in today's world, it'd probably be over, be over 3,000 because, you know, uh, an oral surgeon and then a new crown. The crown itself now is, is you know, 1,400. So, but it was $1,400. I didn't have it. I asked the dentist for a prescription of antibiotics. So, uh, and the dentist said, well, that's not going to fix anything. What will happen is the pain will subside while you're on antibiotics. But as soon as the antibiotics are done, the full pain, the full infection is going to come raging back. Uh, but I, I asked for the prescription anyway because I wanted to buy myself time. I wanted to walk through a process of learning how to get my healing by faith. And I knew that that involved taking every thought captive and that kind of thing. So, um, and I also wanted to buy a little bit of time because at that time that I was in my second year of the second Bible school that I attended and I was scheduled to preach <laughs> for one of my classes and I didn't want to have a raging abscess root canal distracting me in pain while I'm trying to, you know, deliver my message. So I got the antibiotics and it did make the pain subside. I was able to give my message, but sure enough, just like the dentist said, as soon as as antibiotics were over, the pain was back. And I had been journalizing. I had been uh, writing down the thoughts uh, that had crossed my mind because it says in 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5, for the weapons of our warfare are not, 
are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into, into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So that's what I was doing. I was, I was journalizing so I could take every thought captive. The problem is most of the time people aren't aware of the random thoughts that go through their mind and they just fall victim to everything and they're not recognizing that the spirit world operates by agreement. So if, if a thought comes our way and if we agree with it, and sometimes our silence is agreeing with it, if we agree with it, then we invite that into our life. So we got we to gotta cast down wrong arguments. So I had been journalizing. Uh, I had been journalizing and, and one of the thoughts that crossed my mind, you're not healed. And I countered back, yes, I am. By Jesus stripes, I'm healed. You're not healed. The abscess is going to send you to the hospital with toxic poisoning. No, and here's my counter back. <laughs> no, Isaiah 53 says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And by his stripes, we are healed. And the griefs mean sicknesses and the sorrows mean pain, meaning that's how they could also be translated. I am healed. And then the, the negative voice said, it's going to cause you to lose some of your teeth. And then my response was, no, I'm, going, I'm not going to lose my teeth. Song of Solomon says, your teeth are like a flock of shorn sheep and none is barren among them. <laughs> you like that? Uh, uh, and then the next one is, toxic poisoning will get into your bloodstream and you will die. And then my counter to that was, no, I shall live and declare the works of the Lord. And that's out of Psalms 18, uh, 118, 17. But you know what? If it takes finding a random scripture, like out of Song of Solomon to say, hey, all, none of your teeth are missing, then that's okay. You can... Uh, Dog, stop. The dog is choosing to eat the plastic plant because that's what he does. He's not a good dog. <laughs> so um, so it's okay to find scriptures that line up with what we're seeking and use the scriptures almost like a weapon. You know, because we are, you know, Joyce Meyer wrote a book, the, the battlefield is in the mind, and it's true. So when the devil comes at us one way, we come at it another. And what do we do? We fight with the word, with the word, with the word. When Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days, what did he do when the devil put different thoughts on him? He responded back using the word of God. And that's what we do uh, when we're countering this just full on assault that is attacking us and, and coming at us. So um, in these situations, demons often try to get us into fear and to wear us down. Get us into fear and wear us down. And you need to fight both of those things. Recognize what's happening in your mind when you're being mentally attacked. Because you're not just being attacked in your body. You are being attacked in your mind. So how do you combat it? You combat it with the attacks that are going on in your mind. Um, you know, so the prescription, uh, wore off and I, I had this, this, you know, pain that was just out of control and I, uh, I was driving in my car and I, I just kind of said to God, I said, God, you know, I will gladly suffer any pain if it helps me understand, uh, the mental battle of, of, of healing. I, I will gladly go through any pain if it helps me get to the next level with you. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to me very clearly and said, it's not my will that you be in pain. I pulled the car over and I just thought about that a second. Did I have a martyr mentality in my subconscious mind? Did I have this martyr mentality that thought that I would gladly suffer anything because Jesus suffered for me? And the next question or issue is, God doesn't want us to have pain. You know, at that time I was attending a church that every Sunday night they had a healing service and that message of healing um, was there all the time. You know, it's not God's will that we be in pain and suffering. It is God's will that we be healed. Why didn't I know that in my subconscious mind? I certainly agreed with it in my conscious mind. I, I could preach it. I mean, I, I've heard so many sermons about it, but somehow... When, when God spoke that to me, I recognized that what I believed in my head wasn't in my gut. It wasn't there. Because if it was there, then I would take God's word and embrace that, and then my healing would manifest. So uh, so I just kind of, I, I, I pulled over alongside the road because I had been driving, and in just a few minutes, and I just started meditating. 
it is God's will. I kept repeating it and rehearsing it. It is God's will that I'd be healed. I mean, because I knew it was God's voice and I knew what he said. It wasn't my mind playing tricks on me or I knew that it was the Holy Spirit speaking to me saying it's not God's will that I be in pain. So I just meditated on that. And then it's like, okay, okay. It, and then I just suddenly knew everything would be okay. It's like, okay, it's not God's will. And, and somehow just in the car that day, it's saying from here to here, it, it got in my gut. And then within an hour or two, uh, I, I, I went to run an errand and did something else. I didn't even think about it again. I didn't think about my tooth again. And then uh, I recognized an hour or two later, oh my gosh, all pain is gone. Then I am looking in my car mirror and bending down my, my lip. The swelling and infection and pus was all gone. I was healed. I was healed. And for me, it wasn't an instant healing the second I, I, I agreed with that, but it was a, a, a an expedited healing. So instead of taking, you know, days, it took minutes to heal that ailment within me. So um, what ha I had ha experienced in the car was, I, I don't know how to explain describe it except I was blanketed by peace so it's like oh, you know it's like the light came on and I and I was blanketed by a peace and, and there was the fear was all gone and, and and I just knew everything was gonna be okay and I will say this um the other church that I used to go to in the 90s from 95 to 2001 the pastor always said Faith begins at the known will of God. Now, even though technically we can move mountains by our faith, because it doesn't say that you have to have a word from God that that mountain's supposed to move, technically we could if we had tapped into that power, and most of us haven't, and <laughs> most of us won't. But I will say this, it is much easier to find the light switch of faith if we know something is God's will. Faith begins at the known will of God. So when we know God's will about a situation, it's easier to get that from our head to our heart. Um, also, having hope is absolutely necessary. Uh, now, Christians, a lot of times Christians, they think that they're in faith, but they're really in hope. So they think I'm standing in faith. Actually, what they're standing in is hope. Now, hope is both in our conscious mind and our subconscious mind. There's like deposits of hope. And I'm going to be talking about that in the next video that I do. But hope is a substance of things hoped for. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So that hope is already resident in our subconscious mind. And I kind of envision it like hope is like a seed, a lemon seed. So it's there, but it's not till that seed sprouts, then it becomes a living organism that, that grows into a tree. Likewise, we may have a seed, uh, uh, we may have a seed in fertility, for instance, but it's not till um, there's conception where that seed becomes fertilized and then it becomes an embryo. I liken that to, to faith as well. So the, the hope is like the egg and then, and then faith it's like the fertilized egg, then it starts growing and developing and it, 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 it's new life. That's how it is. But but like with a seed, a seed could sit dormant for a long time and it's never growing because that's like hope. But faith is is a growing new ent entity or, or I don't want to say entity, a, a new growth of life within your, your heart, your spirit. Okay, I'm going to move, in, move on because I don't want to take a long time with this. But hope is absolutely necessary. Uh, now let's look at how does healing come? Well, healing can come by God just zapping us healed. Cool. That works. Healing can come when we have faith for it, which is what I'm talking about now. Uh, healing could also come by the prayer of faith. It talks about that in, uh, in James 5, 13 through 16, where you go to the elders, the church elders, and they pray the prayer of faith over you. So faith can come different ways. But our goal is to get the word of God in us so that when we do receive uh, faith, because I've seen people receive their healing and then lose their healing. Uh, it was authentic healing that they received, but they didn't have the belief strong enough to keep their healing. 
So it's important to get the word of God in us about healing, about that. You know, um, when we read the Bible and we read different teachings, uh, it's like computer a computer programmer. So in the last chapter, we talked about our psyche being like a computer where our hard drive is like our subconscious mind and a keyboard is what the computer program uses to reprogram the wrong coding that could be in us. Well, that is our words. It says that uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, the word of God. So we got to get the words of God uh, typed. We got to get the word of God in us so that can, in whatever configuration, sink down from our head to our heart so that we could have that revelation. You know, I know of a few people that actually received their healing when they read the book, Christ the Healer by F.F. F. Bosworth. Now that's a book that's been around for decades, but is there anything extra special about it? Well, I, I'm sure there are books written by authors today that are just as powerful, may even have more of an anointing. I don't know. But what that book has is it has several dozens of different scriptural messages on healing. So in this he in this verse, it's over here talking about uh, a specific verse that talks about healing over here. It may use the same verse, but it's coming at it from a different angle over here. It's a different a different verse. So there's different teachings about healing. And what I think is interesting, and I mentioned this in the last se section, when it talks about the word of God being living and powerful and how our mind uh, joins together, like we talked about the joint. Well, it joins together one thought and one thought. Well, we also said that um, there is a range of movement at a joint. So we can understand a truth at one angle and we can understand it a slightly different way at a different angle. Well, when we look at the different messages and sermons on healing, we don't know exactly which phraseology, which angle is going to be the one that actually unlocks the healing where we that information comes from our head to our heart. That's why it's important to just feed all of it in. We, we, when, if we're going through a challenge for healing, we need to feed on the word of God, feed on the word of God, because uh, we don't know. It, it could be one simple phrase, one simple phrase that just catches us a certain way and that unlocks our healing in our subconscious mind. Also, it's a good idea to uh, get rid of pride because pride, I envision pride like, uh, you know, it talks about in Ezekiel, we could have a hard heart and we could have a cold heart. Well, I kind of envision pride that it could be like a, a, a frozen over pond between our conscious mind and our subconscious mind. So what happens when we have pride, pride not only leads to deceptive thinking, pride could also block our discernment. So when the Holy Spirit speaks to us from our spirit, travels through our subconscious mind, it can't register as a thought in our conscious mind because we, we have a layer of icy pride in our heart that is blocking that. Likewise, when we're hearing the word uh, over and over and our heart has pride, we're gonna have a hard time getting that word from our head to our heart because our heart is hard and we may not realize it. So if you're looking to, to understand faith better and you're looking to get information, God's word from our head to our heart, start with working on pride and, and uprooting levels of pride so it can cause cracks in the ice and, and, and melting of the ice so that your heart is more pliable so the word of God can sink down into fertile soil. So that is another clue on how to get faith. <laughs> I'm trying to whiz by and I don't know if I'm making any sense, but I, I did one other recording and I, I went way too long. So I'm trying to abbreviate my information so I don't go on too long. But we have to understand that when we feed on the word of God, it is literally faith food. It is faith food. And how do we build our spirit is we make it healthy and strong by feeding it faith food, feeding it the word of God. I also want to mention this story. I won't go into full detail. It is in the book. I mentioned in the book that my sister Stephanie had a lot of neck and back pain. So she went to ER quite often and they gave her shots of Demerol. Well, one of the times they had run a CAT scan and they discovered that her spine had a bunch of holes in it. And it was caused because she had breast cancer that had metastasized and metastasized and eaten away at the bone. One doctor described it as 
Your spine is like Swiss cheese. That's a literal quote. And because of that, she was all weak and everything else. Well, she had waited and we were very close at the time. And when that doctor gave that diagnosis, she told me that she had known for years that she had a lump in her breast, but she was standing in faith for it. Okay, brand new information to me. And it was the type of cancer that if she would have caught it early and started treating it early, it would have never gone to a stage four. But maybe she was afraid of losing her hair. Or maybe she didn't want to look like she didn't have strong faith. I don't know all the reasons of why she didn't take action, but in her mind, she was standing in faith. In actuality, she was standing in denial. So what we need to make sure of if we're on a faith journey is that we're not labeling our denial as faith because they are very different. You know, her justification of not, of not taking action is she didn't want people to know about the lump in her breast because she didn't want people to curse her. She didn't want to give more authority to the kingdom of darkness. And she was talking about that scripture out of Proverbs 1821 that says life and death are in the power of the tongue. And she didn't want anybody speaking against her. Well, that's all true and good. You know, there is a level of truth in that, but it's not really uh, what others say about us. It's what we say about ourselves. We can curse ourselves and we can curse others to a degree. But when you have faith, it doesn't matter who's speaking against you. They could be planning your funeral. The devils could be throwing, the demons could be throwing a party. It doesn't matter. When you have authentic faith, that overrules all of it. They'll be, they'll be left stumped. They'll be left bewildered. True faith will cause, will cause healing if we get it from our head to our heart. So um, there is a level of truth in that where, where death and life are in the power of the tongue. But by denying it and, and being so scared, people are going to curse you. Well, being in fear is evidence that you're not in faith. Fear and faith are opposites. And that really is one of the ways you tell if you are in faith. A lot of people have believed they were standing in faith and they were really standing in hope. And, and they, they didn't get the miracle that they needed. So it's important to distinguish that and have a better understanding of it. Denying cancer's right to be in your body is a good thing. You know, when I had the abscess root canal, it was, I was denying that thing, that infection's right, the abscess's right to be in my body. We can't agree with it because that invites it in. Spirit world, the spirit world operates by agreement. We do have to be careful of our words. We do have to have a spiritual battle uh, when it comes to the thoughts that we embrace in our mind. But we need to recognize that when we're in true faith, there is a, a fearless peace that rests on us. And as well, when we're in authentic faith, our actions will follow because um, our actions will follow what we believe in our heart. Because I've said before, and I, you know, our beliefs and our behaviors are driven from our subconscious mind, not our conscious mind. So if we have faith in our subconscious mind, our actions are going to be reflected in it. We're not faking it. You know, we're not faking peace. We have peace. We have joy. You know, we, we have these things regardless of what a doctor's report is. So that's important to understand is authentic peace has action attached to it. And it has a, a blanketed peace on our mind. We're not, we're not in a constant storm anymore. Now, I won't go into the other details of Stephanie's story. It is in this book. But, and I encourage you to read it because it, it is an interesting story. And Stephanie's story is a bit dramatic, but it's a good example of how to recognize the difference between faith and denial. Denial is really just hope pretending to be faith. So we need to be aware of that and cognizant of that when we say we're standing in faith for something. If there's fear, you're not in faith yet. Also, let me make this point. When it comes to believing God's word and, and faith, understand that there's a difference between redemptive promises from God and destiny promises from God. Redemptive promises from God are those things that were covered that when Jesus rose from the grave, rose from the grave, <laughs> sorry, rose from the grave and took back the keys to death, hell, and the grave, and he got authority in the earth. That's that word that he came to bring is salvation. Salvation is sozo in the Greek. And really that encompasses 
salvation, healing, peace, deliverance, restoration, provision, prosperity. It encompasses things. It, it, it means wholeness, nothing broken, nothing missing. And uh, stop it. Dog's chewing the basket that the tree is in. Of course he is. Of course, because I'm trying to do a broadcast. So when we have that, with the redemptive promises, there's not an, a gestation period. There's not an incubation period. Um, we, we're not standing in faith for our salvation. No, the minute you accept Jesus Christ into your heart, th there's not a process. There's not a time period between when you believe that you receive. With redemptive pro promises, you believe and you receive in its instant. Now, when it comes to healing, when it comes to uh, when it comes to healing, it could be a, a process. It, stop it. It could be instant, or it could be a process that unfolds. It could be expedited healing. When my mouth healed up, it, it healed up within an hour or two. Well, that was an expedited healing. It wasn't zapped healed the minute I believed in my heart, but it was an expedited healing process. So the same is true. And even with finances, when we have true faith for finances, the finances are on the way. We may not get a knock on the door the very second that we have faith for finances and somebody may not hand us a check. Here's $10,000 here. We may, that may not happen, but we have the assurity that when we have faith for it and we've obeyed God's word, and God's will and make sure we're not sabotaging something because so many times, you know, we want the financial blessing, but maybe we've been disobedient. Maybe we've self-sabotaged something, which is super common. Um, so it, as long as we know on our side of the ledger, stop it, Oliver, come. It, on our side of the ledger that there's not an area of obedience that we're lacking in and we have that assurance and we have now faith for finances, it's on its way, whether we see it right this minute or not. Maybe it'll show up in a week. Maybe it'll show up in two weeks. And in the meantime, God will sustain you when it is authentic faith for, for finances and provision. Um, so our destiny promises are when God gives us a word about our future. So we know that Moses, uh, God gave the promise, you're going to be a deliverer. And then 40 years later, it happened. <laughs> with Joseph, with Joseph, you know, God gave him the promise that he's going to be a great leader. He gave him those dreams. And then it was, what is it, 13 years later, then it, after going through the pit and the, and the prison and everything else, then he went to the palace. So with destiny promises, there is often a gestation period. It's a period of maturing in the things that God needs to impart to us of developing perseverance and everything else. There, there's a process and a, and a training that God oftentimes puts us through. Sometimes it's the, that, that process, that length of time is about our development. And sometimes it's about when your ministry launches, it's for a certain season to happen. So with destiny promises, it's like a gestation of a child. If people try to birth it too soon, it won't survive. So, you know, you got to go the full 40 weeks to have a, the healthiest baby you can. So a lot of times there is a gestation period for the destiny promises that God gives us. But healing promises, healing, peace, salvation, those are redemptive promises and there is no gestation period, to repeat myself. And I will make uh, another point here that it is human nature to, how am I doing on time? Oh, I've got to hurry. It is human nature to not attempt faith for healing when it's a minor ailment. You know, if it's something that's life-threatening or, or, or it's cancer or there's no medical cure or we don't have the money to, to treat it, then we may seek healing. But if it's a little thing, a minor inconvenience, like, oh, we toenail fungus, tendonitis, oh, I need eyeglasses, I have diabetes, uh, you know, what? all these minor ailments, most of the time, we won't attempt to use our faith for it. Eh, it's no big deal, you know, we'll, we'll take the medical route, if anything, and we'll, we'll embrace a lot of these things, not understand that, it, you know, it is part of the devil coming to rob, steal, and destroy. With financial problems, you know, the, the water main breaks at the house, uh, your engine blows up in your car, all these, all these financial crises we tolerate because, oh, it's just part of living. 
And that's human nature. In other countries, they may stand and face stronger because they don't have the medical resources that we have. They may not have the prosperity that this country has. But um, we, we need to get a better revelation that the problem with tolerating ailments and financial challenges is we are conditioning our brain to accept trauma and drama that the devil may send our way. So we know that the devil comes to rob, steal, and destroy. And when we don't fight something, we just accept it. But the problem with that is we are further ingraining the pathways in our subconscious mind to accept the junk that comes our way. So it's a good idea to battle it when it doesn't belong. You know, recognize that, you know, I mentioned in another video that when it comes to demonic forces, I don't have any fear if a demon appears to me in a room. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. I don't have any fear of that. So because I don't have any fear, when the devil tries to put fear on me, he's not trying anymore. That mostly happened in the 90s. But, you know, I haven't seen a demon in forever. But, um, so he doesn't try that. But what he will do is he will masquerade as everyday problems to come in and attack us. And... We get so busy with life that we're not recognizing that. So even though the, the devil may not, your little demon may not wave a flag and say, hey, I'm evil coming to rob, steal, and destroy, we need to understand that authentically that's what it is, and we need to combat that so we stop tolerating uh, the, the junk that the devil would try to throw our way. Devils masquerade as normal everyday problems. And we need to recognize that. And I'm going to close with this thought so I don't continue any longer. And we mentioned it at, at the beginning. Faith can overrule our self-sabotaging tendencies. In the future videos, we're going to be talking about uh, subconscious root causes of self-sabotage. But understanding if we could stand in faith, that overrides our subconscious tendencies for sabotage. All right. Blessings. We'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.